Chairman, dear colleagues, let me present my PhD topic, which is a prognosis and survival for urinary bladder cancer. My name is Andreas Kubik. I'm a trained urologist and a PhD student. My scientific methodology supervisors are Annette Sabba and Bianca Gonzio Navarro. And my vision is to empower patients through excellence in the care they receive from me. And my mission is to provide high quality care for people with urinary bladder cancer. My specific goals are to find biomarkers in urinary bladder cancer to predict uh, patients' prognosis. And uh, as a second topic, we examined rare bladder cancers and we searched the best treatment for this type of uh, non-metastatic small cell bladder cancer patients. For the first topic, that was a combined registry and a meta-analysis when we investigated MMP7 as a prognostic biomarker in ureter carcinoma. And uh, only a few words about urinary bladder cancer. This is the second most common urinary malignancy with more than 200,000 deaths annually, globally. Most of the cases are non-muscle invasive, but about 30% of the cases are muscle invasive. And in that case, the gold standard treatment for them are radical cystectomy, lymphadenectomy, and perioperative chemotherapy. And despite this radical procedure, only half of the patients will benefit uh, and will uh, live longer than five years. So the most significant uh, prognostic factors are the lymph nodes, and we need some biomarkers to predict these patients. And my aim is to assess the prognostic role of one of these biomarkers like MMP7 and why matrix metalloproteinases. They are uh, proteolytic enzymes. They uh, support the cellular processes like extracellular matrix remodeling, angiogenesis, apoptosis, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, and cell proliferation. And these functions uh, suggest that these are good for diagnostic or prognostic biomarkers and as well therapeutic targets. So it has been shown in the literature that the elevated serum tissue and urine MMP7 levels are associated with the lymph node metastasis, and these high preoperative serum MMP7 levels are independent and unfavorable prognostic factors, and its prognostic value in serum and plasma has been validated in independent patient cohorts. Assessing more than 10 MMPs, only MMP7 was uh, prognostic, and in formal studies, assessing more than 400 proteins uh, in urinary bladder cancer, this MMP7 was among the top five uh, biomarkers. So for the clinical registry, we drafted the following question. Do patients with elevated MMP7 levels have worse overall survival rates? We take the population like muscle invasive bladder cancer patients. The PICO framework is used for high level and low level pretreatment. MMP7 levels and overall survival was the main outcome. And we hypothesized that muscle invasive bladder cancer patients with lymph node disease, uh, positive disease and high MMP7 levels have poorer prognosis. For the clinical implication, may these biomarker helps to find optimal treatment for high risk bladder cancer patients. So one, the first retrospective cohort is from uh, SM with 87 muscle invasive bladder cancer patients using the ELISA sandwich method. And uh, the second one from uh, the Semmelweis University with 68 uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer patients. And as you can see on these uh, pictures, uh, measuring the pretreatment uh, MMP7 levels on the second picture, you can see that only half of the lymph node positive patient had high MMP7 concentration before the surgery. And our main conclusion was, looking at the first picture, that the patients with lymph node negative, high serum MMP7 levels, this is the one cycle, have same poor survival to lymph node positive and high MMP7 uh, levels patients, which is the third one. So it may be uh, because of the possible existence of undetected micrometastasis in our cohort. 
So for the meta-analysis, we drafted the following clinical question. Can preoperative MMP serum and plasma levels predict disease progression in urotelia carcinoma? So it's a wider population. Urotel cancer patients treated with surgery or systematic therapy where the uh, population uh, high level and low level before the surgery and outcome was override survival. And we hypothesized that these elevated MMP7 serum and plasma levels are prognostic indicators of urotelia cancer patients' outcome. May it have to find optimal treatment for these patients. Looking through the data, we found more than 400 articles and six was were eligible for uh, this meta-analysis. And uh, the main outcome was overall survival for these urotelia bladder cancer patients. And the hazard ratio of 2.69 uh, means that the probability of mortality for these elevated high MMP7 uh, pretreatment levels patients was 2.7 times higher than in the uh, lower range. So a summary, the strengths, this was the first meta-analysis regarding this biomarker. We performed also an ad hoc post hoc cohort analysis regarding the surgical decision making, the extent of the lymphadenectomy during these procedures, and this was a quite homogeneous uh, population. The limitations are the different cutoff values, the serum and plasma levels, and uh, uh, retrospective studies. So as conclusion, muscle invasive bladder cancer patients with leave node positive diseases, high MMP7 levels have poorer prognosis. The indication for practice that determination of MMP7 levels may help to identify patients who need treatment intensification, and these preoperative levels have uh, to identify patients with lymph node metastasis. And the implication for research that maybe we should um, try MMP-targeted uh, inhibition as possible therapeutic approach. It has been published last year. And so moving to my uh, second topic, which is a treatment for a rare uh, bladder cancer. This is a small cell bladder cancer without any, any metastasis. You have to know about this is less than 1% all of the cases, and we wanted to find the optimal treatment for this kind of uh, bladder cancer patients. And uh, looking through the data and in the guidelines says that uh, it should be treated individually and different methods with bladder pres preserving or uh, radical cystectomy are the main treatment for these patients. And we wanted to prove that the optimal treatment for patients with non-metastatic small cell bladder cancer can uh, maybe not radical uh, cystectomy. So we drafted this question, what is the optimal treatment using the PICO framework population for small cell bladder cancer patients intervention the radical procedure when we uh, dissect the, blow, the bladder and the lymph nodes and they get systemic therapy or bladder preserving. This is an endoscopic minimal invasive way and overall survival was measured as main outcome. And we hypothesized that radical cystectomy did not influence overall survival in the patients with non-metastatic disease. More than 1,600 uh, articles were collected and only five eligible for the full text selection. And may, our main uh, overall, uh, outcome was overall survival with more than 1,000 patients. And the hazard ratio of 0 0.8 suggested that patients with non-metastatic small cell bladder cancer uh, tumors do not benefit from radical surgery. So we are still in progress. We uh, send it to the European Urology Focus, and it, it is uh, submitted. And uh, these were my two topics. And about my additional activities, I have a new a TDK student. We are trying to investigate the predictive role of a lymphovascular invasion, invasion in the same muscle-invasive bladder cancer a group, uh, we investigated the prevalence of uracal carcinoma and it was submitted uh, earlier. And uh, pretreatment clinical and hematologic prognostic factors of metastatic uracal carcinoma uh, treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors was uh, collected and we have uh, cooperation with other
cities with Vienna also, and uh, I partici participated in conferences in Hungary and in, on abroad, and I'm a laparoscopic a surgeon, so I'm very proud that I can take part in uh, surgical treatment of this patient as well, and I'm a robot-assisted bedside surgeon. So thank you very much for your attention. Let me close with my motto. You miss 100% of the shots you never take from, from Wayne Gretzky. Thank you very much. This is my passion, bladder cancer, <laughs> as Andres knows, we're actually working together. So Andres, I wanted to ask um, a few questions. Um, Number one, you started very well off, and then suddenly you went into this lymph node story. And I didn't know where it came from, and it was not based on any of your introduction, or was it conceptually or, or from the biology that you think MMP7 has some preponderance that I missed somewhere for lymphatic spread? Uh, MMP7 were... Um uh, produced by the tumor cells, mm. so the blood work cancer cells producing uh, these, mm. and in the lymph nodes they are producing as well MMP7s, and that's why the elevated levels can be higher after such an operation if the lymph nodes are in the patients and they are not totally resicated. Okay, so if you have, because the assumption is your blood hematologic spread and lymphatic spread are two different pathways. They can be connected, they don't have to be connected, right? You have yeah. disease that's spread only lymphatic, and you have a wide metastatic lymphatic spread, some that are hematological or lymphatic, and some, you know, only mm -hmm. hematological. So uh, I would assume if you measure it in blood, that you would look for all the type of metastasis, and then you just narrowed it down to the lymphatic story. Um, and I, I would expect to, for you to look other sides of metastasis, you know, I really look at outcomes, you know, outcomes beyond the lymph node story. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, you probably have done this. Yes. Uh, beyond the lymph nodes, uh, metastasis, there are, um, these are the elevated levels in the blood, which we collected. So, and uh, these levels were higher after radical procedures, and it meant that maybe there were some residual tumor there and some metastases which were not detected during the CT scan or the follow-up or by the pathologist after the procedure. So we, that's why we performed the serum plasma levels, but <clears throat> tissue levels, uh, could be measured also and urinary, but that was not the, the part of this um, collection. So because the, the question, I, I guess, in all the cancers, it's about over-treatment and under-treatment. And you addressed it sort of in both studies, and I think this is very good. And, and the question is here, do you use it as a predictive marker? Do you use it as a prognostic marker? Do you use it as a marker of um, response? to use it as a marker of minimal residual disease. So where would you put MMP7's value? I mean, you, you obviously have looked through all the literature, and, and where would you put its value in the thing? Because now what you told me sounds to me it's marker of minimal residual disease after resection. Yeah, it's, it, we use it as a prognostic uh, biomarker. So before the surgery was measured, and in our second cohort after the surgery was measured these uh, levels also. So if there were um, lymph nodes, then it's elevated uh, level. It was uh, a guide or maybe a help for the, the treatment in the future. So after the, the surgical treatment, we could use these kind of MMP7 levels to predict what kind of treatment, when, uh, to give the patients. Right. So and let me ask you from a statistic, and the statisticians will correct me if I'm uh, correct. So you showed us in the first one a univariate, a univariate analysis, right? Yes. So you, you, you go there and you say, um, well, I have a univariate analysis. This looks good. I mean, this is multivariable. But these studies all must have had multivariable analysis in their 
do you use the multivariable analysis from the studies to extract that, right? And uh, each would have corrected, adjusted for something else, right? You want some pre-op, some post-op, some, or these are all pre pre-treatment. Th these are all pre-treatment. Pre but uh, some treatment. had chemotherapy, some had surgery. Uh, these are uh, urinary cancer patients uh, underwent surgery, and uh, syst or systematic therapy. So the lower two for upper okay. tract urinary cancer, they underwent uh, systematic System. therapy. So this is a quite a bit other population with a higher uh, confidence interval and a bit uh, a higher um, prognosis for the. Good. The question, I guess, is that are these hazard ratios like rho hazard yeah. ratios, or right. they come from some adjusted model like Cox uh, regression or something like They came from Cox regression model. But only involving these two, uh, these two groups, or maybe you had other uh, predictors involved in the models? Because uh, that ri then rises the question if they are poolable at all. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Uh, we, for, for what? So again, if you have a HR, it, it, it is always called an HR, hazard ratio, yes. equals something. But it might come from a simple or a more complex model, multivariate analysis, something like that. So did you, I think that's That's the, the question, question. Is, is because I look at this, and uh, uh, 20, 30 patients, you may not you know, have enough events for multivariate analysis, you have univariate, some are univariate analysis data you take analysis, some are multivariate analysis, taking, right? Adjusted mm -hmm. for other factors. Yeah, like. And then you, we mix it together as well, and then I don't know if that is, adds the same thing, you know? I don't know if you. It's, yeah, yeah. It's a I random mean, the question is did you yeah. go into it? Did you check if it was from multivariate or univariate analysis, basically? It's, I think that's an important question. Yeah, it, it, I think they were from, from univariate uh, analysis and these were as a random effects model which was pooled the hazard ratios of these. Oh, that's another thing how we pooled them. The question is where the data come from. So what you extracted from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably the mix, um, very difficult to say. Because for upper tract, you know, it's very hard to control for. So I would, I would in this, I would take the upper tract anyway out, as you anyway mm -hmm. suggested, right? because this is small patient population. On top of it, it's very difficult in preoperative to adjust for anything in the upper tract, but in bladder cancer, obviously muscle invasive, you have a lot of things that reflect that you had probably adjusted for. I, I'm just saying this because I'm doing similar things and I'm always thinking about the errors yeah. I have done in the past. Let me ask you one other thing. Plasma and serum, you obviously have looked into that. Why, why you said plasma and serum is both okay. But I would think one has platelets, one not. The way you extract it is a vacuum device. Is that, um, you think, something that needs to be adjusted for as well? Because you could get false elevations or not? I, I'm not sure about the biology of MMP7. Um, these, were, these were the um, different, the different uh, measurements, and uh, these levels were corrugated. So, but this is one of the limitations. So serum and plasma levels are not the same for these MMP7. Um, may I just go back to the previous uh, figure, please? Yeah. So here you see uh, that the low and high is defined at uh, 7.15. Like, was this uh, a cutoff uh, consistent throughout the included studies? Uh, yes. It did. So this is like a uniformly Accepted. It was one of, in these uh, studies, uh, as a, a primary uh, cutoff value, but we performed the ROC analysis okay. uh, in our uh, patient cohort, and we uh, measured this uh, um, uh, MMP7 uh, cutoff value regarding the greatest specificity and the sensitivity that for That was my <laughs> next okay. question. So this limit, this cutoff value comes from your own from, patient from cohort. Our, so this is you set. This we limit. set it in this uh, cohort. Okay, and, and here, did you have any chance to carry out something like a sensitivity specificity analysis in your uh, meta-analysis? Um, 
Or was that even an idea or a chance for that? Um, no, I don't think so. Because no. you just mentioned prediction, like we have something that predicts some later outcome. So that sounds like a, like a good idea at the first glance. Mm -hmm. How well you can predict. Okay. I'm asking, uh, yeah. or, or did you consider this if uh, you rejected the idea of I? No, not really. So, because uh, these, these, um, uh, I cannot answer now with this uh, okay. question. Then Sorry then for we this. We can discuss. Sorry for this. I want, I want to ask you a question that I don't know the answer, but maybe you can have a better feeling. You say it's prognostic of, let's say, lymph node metastasis or uh, micrometastatic disease, right? That's mm -hmm. what we assume because it's associated with worse outcomes. And so. How much of prognostic effect would something need to have for you to change your practice? So it's, it's such a, I mean, he asked a question in a previous question, on a previous speaker as well, right? It's about the clinical margin of benefit. I mean, how much is it is good enough for you? I mean, you're looking at this, the numbers to say, look, it's you're 2.7 times more likely to die if you have elevated levels. So, the, more than one is, is uh, good? Is, is good? already good? <laughs> but is how much would it be for you? Because I assume if you have a muscle invasive bladder cancer and you have this, and I'm sorry if I bore everybody with this, you, you would go to new adjuvant chemotherapy or you would, you, you would intensify your therapeutic modality by, by saying this guy has micrometastasis or this lady has micrometastatic disease, so I need to treat the micrometastasis more aggressively. Or if they had new adjuvant chemo in one of, you know, that, the one group, you would say, well, I need to change to another regimen that is maybe more intense, more, more likely to succeed. So how much is the value, I mean, how much, and, and I don't know the answer to that, that's the problem, you know, because the, the, the issue you would need to have is then to test it in a new adjuvant cohort and to see if it predicts, you know, response to new adjuvant or whatever therapy you have. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, what, this, basically the question is what is predictive, what is prognostic, and how much your prognostic changes your therapy, how much you need to change your therapy. I mean, if, you, if somebody you measure in the clinic now, MMP7, right, the, in yes. plasma, and you say, wow, this is high. I yeah, mean, this is first of all, you have a cutoff. 7.14 nanogram per milliliter. This was with the help of the uh, rock analysis. Yep. And if it's under, then it's a high probability uh, to these patients do not have any uh, metastasis. But it's it's above 7.15, uh, then it's problematic. So, so you would feel like if it is negative, I'm safe not to intensify. Not, re not really because it's only a, a um, or yeah, a check. But um, it's exploratory, right? Exploratory thing. So you said anyway, you need to test it in, in a in a clinical trial. The problem is I don't ever think that a clinical trial will assess and randomize based on a biomarker. That's a problem. It's very expensive to run a randomized clinical trial. And short of that, you could do clinical decision analysis or other models of you know, integrated analysis to short of that. Um, I don't know the answer. I mean, nobody will know the answer mm -hmm. to, to the question I asked. It was a theoretical question. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Well, it is a theoretical question, but in Hungary, we used to say that if something is more than two, <laughs> then, then it happens, or so. so that's why I recommend to answer that if it is more, the odds ratio is more than two, or the relative risk is more than two. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. <laughs> yes, of course. Because in the, in a small cell. So, so it's, it's just a joke for me. <laughs> because in a small cell group, you assume, and I don't know. I'm, look, I'm not a statistician. If you go to the small cell, and uh, I mean these are all very good, good stuff. The small cell, you said. Um, the figure you had, right? Here you say, look, um, for me, tremor therapy or, or, or bladder preserving therapy wasn't tremor. Yes. Bladder preserving, 
Well, it's, it is tremol to a certain degree, right? Because they got chemotherapy first. Yes. Right. Tremol as a consolidation, uh, getting a resection and a TUR uh, and a radiation or whatever is better than thing. But I'm looking at this and I'm looking at the hazard ratio. I'm saying, no, it isn't. It's 95 confidence intervals are so wide. And even your studies go all over the place. So I'm thinking to myself, how can you conclude that? Maybe I'm wrong statistically. Tell me, no, no. teach me better. <laughs> it's non significant, and the uh, confidence interval is uh, very high. And this, it's uh, for us uh, clinically relevant that we do not have to choose the radical procedure because it's not significantly better. So we changed a bit the question, and we wanted to prove that these patients do not need this radical procedure. I, th I think your question is fantastic. That's the conclusion is, patients with non-metastatic small cell bladder tumors do not been after response to systemic therapy, uh, are, uh, do not have, you know, uh, in these patients, radical surgery seems to be equal to bladder sparing. That would be the thing. Yes. You see, do not benefit from radical surgery. First of all, the benefit maybe because your control arm, if I read it like this, could be doing nothing. And number two, it does not seem that you know tremor is better or whatever bladder sparing is better. It's just not worse. Yes. So. So you assuming you assuming that radiation, you know, you are, am I correct or am I? It's absolutely yes. correct. So I I think that here, uh, rephrasing would benefit the project because I would just say that there is no evidence for benefit. That doesn't mean that there is no benefit. Mm -hmm. We just don't have evidence. I think there is a little problem that we have in many of the projects the fear to say something. We want to say we found, we proved this or we disproved this. Yeah. This is what we always expect. But we can also say that's a, unfortunately a quite common conclusion that we don't have an evidence to decide whether it's superior or equivalent. Because the, here this is the case. It would be easier to interpret if we had the critical ma uh, margin, uh, what uh, just uh, Professor uh, Shariat mentioned. But uh, so far I would say we don't have evidence, which is a fair thing because you are not responsible for what you find in the uh, literature. And then you could conclude in your discussion yeah. saying every patient wants to keep their bladder, so probably it would come to the same, same thing, but you know. Yes, yes, yes. That, that was the main goal of this uh, meta-analysis to, right. to, to, show to, to show it and the better quality. Yeah. So you can say that we have like a, a traditional way to treat and then we don't have evidence that substantiates that we need to change it. We need more evidence to we be collected. More, we yes. cannot say that they are equally good. We cannot say they are it's superior. We just say that no, not enough evidence yet on the current state of science and technology. I think it okay. also comes to your hypothesis. Your yes. Was, so you, you, you need to answer that hypothesis. OK. I think this is a very important question in black cancer. So you're addressing a very important issue. Thank you.